Right. So uh, when uh, Knut Hamsun uh, reached his old age, he became the subject of a series of betrayals. Uh, what we need to recall first is that uh, at this time, Hamsun had become the national inheritor of the founding father of modern Norwegian literature, Bjorn Stjerne Bjornsson, and also um, what is today the most well-known voice of Norwegian literature globally, Henrik Ibsen. Uh, he saw himself in that role. He consciously built a life around himself that would fit into this role as the inheritor of these uh, father figures. And uh, as he reached his old age, he became in his 70s and then in the 80s, his creative spark waned a little bit. Uh, he didn't write so much fiction. He became increasingly interested in his public persona. And it is this public figure that also became his, uh, his downfall, okay? So uh, in this uh, presentation, we will talk about three betrayals uh, that were key to his late life. Uh, first uh, and most well known is of course uh, the betrayal that most people would say he did against his own country. Uh, when the German forces invaded Norway on the 9th of April 1940, Hamsun clearly and unequivocally took the invading forces side and advised the Norwegians to lay down their weapons. Okay, uh, that in itself uh, would in one view amount to treason. Uh, and uh, what is further is that throughout the war he supported the Germans. He went to visit uh, the Germans in Germany. Uh, he wrote many newspaper columns about it and uh, so on and so forth. And uh, he was probably a member of the Norwegian arm of the National Socialist Party as well. Now, the concern in this uh, presentation is the sense of these uh, betrayals uh, to Homsen and the possible inevitability of the treasons. And what we're going to show is that uh, what Homsen did in his last work was to mobilize these betrayals in his defense against who he perceived as being his last enemy, the psychiatrist Gabriel Langfeldt. And to give you sort of a context for this, let us begin by briefly uh, watching a video. It is from 1944. Uh, Hamsun was then 85 years old. He was celebrated by the Germans and by their Norwegian cronies as the supreme literary figure of Norway. And here we will see the standing he had in occupied Norway in 1944, okay, just briefly.
All right. Okay. What is clear is that after 1945 uh, and the liberation of Norway, Homsen was indicted uh, and accused of uh, treason. And what happened was that the national prosecutor then uh, addressed the chief uh, criminal psychiatrist in Norway, Gabriel Langfeldt, and asked him if it was appropriate to have Hamsun assessed uh, to find out whether he was fit to stand trial. Uh, Langfeldt agreed to this and uh, Hamsun was uh, incarcerated at Vinland Psychiatric Clinic uh, outside Oslo for three to four months uh, at the end of 1945, beginning of 1946. And uh, it is no doubt that Hamsun felt deeply insulted by these events. After uh, the assessment, which uh, ended with Langfeldt claiming that Thompson suffered from uh, permanently impaired mental faculties, uh, and, and the prosecutor then deemed him unfit to stand trial, there has been a long line of scholarship that has either claimed that Thompson was mistreated by the psychiatric profession or that he was deeply misunderstood. And uh, some of these figures uh, are uh, Torkil Hansen, who wrote an early book uh, about the, the criminal proceedings and the psychiatric evaluation of Hansen. Uh, this is an early sort of response, right? Uh, what we have today is a more up-to-date perspective. Uh, Heidemünster is a primary uh, proponent uh, who claims that uh, Langford uh, was out of his depths, uh, he didn't know what he was talking about, and uh, Homsen was uh, sane and uh, fit. Uh, what is also interesting is uh, the perspective offered by uh, Öystein de Rotten, uh, who wrote uh, in the uh, Journal of Norwegian Psychiatrists about 15-20 years ago, a long article uh, where he claims that Hamsun was essentially misunderstood. Uh, and uh, he claims that uh, the domain that Hamsun operated in uh, was outside the jurisdiction, essentially, of the psychiatric profession. And uh, he claims that uh, Hamsun, in Hamsun's case, we should talk about a divine madness. Uh, right. Now, on the other hand, there is also uh, a line that uh, views Hamsun's acts uh, as treasonous, or at least as morally bankrupt. And the first among these were Atle Kittang, who passed away quite recently. And in his view, uh, it isn't only uh, you know, surprising uh, that people are able to read Hamsun today after his acts, but he calls it no less than a miracle that Hamsun's work uh, in Jews today. Okay, so we're going to go a little bit deeper into this now. First, we're going to look at the complex relation that Homsen had to psychoanalysis. And uh, some of you might know that already in 1926, Homsen uh, went into psychoanalysis with Irgen Strömme uh, in Oslo. And uh, at that time, Homsen uh, felt that his creative vein had dried up. He went to Strömme, and uh, the outcome was the Wayfarer trilogy, which is a, a very highly celebrated uh, series of novels, uh, both in Norway and internationally. Uh, and uh, also in Norway, it's often called the August trilogy. So what we have here is sort of a return of the repressed in Hamsun's uh, authorship. Uh, Freud referred to the return of the repressed as uh, the symptom that sort of reveals the repressed content. Uh, of the unconscious. Uh, so what Strömme did was to enable Hamsun to open up again, to begin again to write creatively. And so, you know, when we come to 1946 and the second analysis of Hamsun, what we have is a quite similar effect in that after the analysis is finished, Hamsun again turns to his creative uh, craft and produces his last masterpiece on overworld paths. Uh, so, 
you know, what we have here is sort of first a uh, positive intervention and then a negative intervention, intervention of the psychoanalytic profession. Uh, what Langfeld did was, or the intervention of Langfeld, uh, refused Thompson to take the role that he cherished the most. And this is a key uh, insight of uh, Kit Zang and also of Robert Ferguson, one of Thompson's uh, biographers. Thompson loved to portray heroic losers. Yeah? And he had done this from the very beginning of his authorship. His early wonder novels are full of these losers who are yet heroes, sort of anti-heroes. Yeah, and what Thompson wanted was to stand trial for treason and lose, and then become this heroic loser. Now, since he was declared unfit to stand trial, this path was blocked for him. So what he had to do instead was to return to his craft, return to these paths that he knew so well, but where he hadn't been for a long time, and begin writing. And the outcome was his last masterpiece. When he came to Vietnam Psychiatric Clinic in 1945, uh, Langfeld knew that he had recently suffered from two strokes in 1942 and 1944. And in Langfeld's view, these strokes had ushered in a, some signs of aphasia in Homsen. And this suspicion that uh, Homsen was suffering from early forms of aphasia, dementia, was strengthened when Homsen demanded to have all the questions put to him in writing. So, you know, from Homsen's perspective, this was sort of an attempt to insult Langfeld and say that Langfeld was below his intellectual level and so on. But to Langfeld, uh, this just confirmed that Homsen's uh, linguistic ability was starting to wane. He needed to see it in writing and consider his answers before he would respond. Uh, and Langfeld was, of course, interested in, as a psychoanalyst, uh, the relation between Homsen and his libidinal uh, impulse. So he, wanted, he asked Homsen uh, a series of questions about it, and then he wanted to interview Marie, his wife. Uh, concerning the same matter. And this is then where, where we find the second betrayal of Homsen's uh, late life. Marie is invited, she talks about their love life to Langfeld, and then she asks to see Homsen at the clinic. Langfeld approves, and this is a second reason why he wants that. He has a creeping suspicion that Homsen has become violently angry and has had pits of anger in his old age another typical sign of dementia. So he can use this meeting between them to see uh, if he will burst out in anger. Uh, so he allows it. But when they meet, Homsun uh, won't speak to her. Uh, he just says that they won't see each other again. And they split. And Marie is convinced that she won't meet him again uh, and that he saw this as betrayal. So. They uh, become estranged for years after this. Homsen is now 80, 87, uh, yeah. And for years he doesn't see his wife. Now, in scholarship on this, uh, you know, people like Hedmundstad says that, well, this was a great insult to Homsen. Uh, it was, uh, an infraction on his humanity and his uh, value as a human being and so on. Well, against that we need to remember two things. First, the gravity of the accusations against him. Treason was a very serious uh, crime and uh, someone who was convicted of treason could have very serious penalty inflicted on them. And you know, in other countries, we see cases like Ezra Pound, who was incarcerated for many, many years, and, and other cases as well. Uh, and the other thing is the importance of this examination, that it was done properly. Uh, you know, when you think of those two factors, you will see that Langfeld was right in implementing serious uh, 
uh, restrictions on Hamsa. And furthermore, what we also need to remember is precisely that the examination by Langford ushered in a new creative impetus on Hamsun's part. Okay, so what we need to understand, in other words, is what we will call here the limiting gesture of psychoanalysis. And so what psychoanalysis does is to reinstate the paternal signifier to the patient. And this is what Strömer did as a positive gesture, enabling Thompson to write the Way Pair Trilogy. And what happens as a negative instance in the case of Langford, where the paternal signifier is reinstalled and enabling Hansen to regain his creativity. Where it often misunderstands is that uh, he believes that, okay, Langford had uh, a legitimacy to speak in his domain as a psychiatrist, but so did Hansen. And uh, when Rottem claims that these domains are equal, this is a kind of a divine madness that stands outside psychoanalysis, this is where he misunderstands. Because even when it comes to art, this is, even this is a domain that is bound by legal and social structures that are formal and that stands over and above it. So when overgrown paths were uh, conceived, it was specifically conceived against psychoanalysis and Gabriel Lampert. And this is, so it shows not only that art is restricted, but that art also can be creative as a result of these strictures. Okay. So now what did Hamsun do is on, on overgrown paths. And this is where we get to the third betrayal. What he does here is to betray what we will call tradition. So the misreading, the common misreading on, over, on overgrown paths is that it is a simple refutal of Gabriel Langfeld's claim that Thompson suffered from permanently impaired mental faculties. And this work shows it. In fact, Heidel Grieg, his um, publisher at Judendal, was the first person to point this out, that the novel is a reputation uh, of Langford in that it shows that Thompson was still able to do complex things. However, the refutal on the part of Thompson, this is further developed in the, in the essay, but the refusal of, of refutal of Thompson is more complex. It is not the kind of argument that says things as Grieg and Heidelstein and Rotem uh, believes. It is rather, if we go with Wittgenstein's terminology here, it is not on the level of saying but it is on the level of showing, it shows something. And here is where we need to heed the words of Toril Moy, who in a recent paper discussing uh, 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 what we call reality literature, uh, she says that, well, the documentation provided by Hansen in an overgrown paths, uh, uh, court proceedings, uh, uh, accusations against Langford per, on the personal level and so on. These aren't there to document reality, but they are there to produce a convincing fictional universe. So what Hansen does is to create a work of art that appears as an autobiography. And what it shows isn't uh, the reality of what happened, but it shows that anything can be art, okay? Anything even incriminatory speech, even uh, defense uh, speeches, uh, and so on. So in that sense, it is a fake autobiography. Yeah? It is not, uh, it, the, the novelty of the novel doesn't lie in that it redesigns the autobiographical genre, but it, uh, or, or that it is an early uh, statement of what Knavsko uh, later reformulates as reality literature, but that it is, but in it we find a new stance of the subject. Okay? So the documentary evidence is kind of like a decoy. And uh, Gabriel Langford would uh, later turn to Yildendal and to the police to have the incriminatory statements about him struck out from the printed volume. And we can imagine that this would cause Thompson to have sort of like a last laugh, okay, he was a very naive reader. 
uh, right? But uh, I mean, other readers do that later as well. And uh, Heidemann Stoff, for example, talks about uh, attempts at censorship against Thompson uh, on Langfeld and the uh, Jutenbell's part. Uh, what they do is that they are sort of tracked by this decoy uh, that Thomason sets up for us. This is not the level of the literary statement here, right? Uh, so the sense lies in a new artistic subject and a new subject of art. If we think of the early wonder uh, novels like Pan and Victoria and so on, mysteries, what we have there is sort of this ecstatic subject, uh, an effect of what we could call vitalism. And what happens is that the subject is so engrossed in his world that he becomes almost wiped out. Okay, the subject is almost not there, he's just totally ecstatic and, uh, and loses himself in the world. In this last work from Hamsun, the subject is clearly present, but he is inventive, he invents his world and he's very attentive to his environment. For example, he says at one point, uh, he is talking about the countryside outside the old age home where he was for a while in Gamestein. He says, it was me who had invented them. It was trees and stones I recognized. Okay. And just a, a bit longer quote to just to show how attentive he can be to the environment. A branch moves with a bird on it. I stop right there. On another branch of another tree, a new bird sits. They seem to belong together, a pair of sparrows who flew towards each other and met and separated five times right before my eyes. Of oh, the infinitely small in the midst of the infinitely great in this incomparable world. I am glad to be alive again. Okay, so this careful aesthetic receptive ability fascinated his readers then and it continues to fascinate us today. What he calls us to do is to read beyond the immediate realism of, uh, of the documentary and beyond the measurable scientific realm of psychiatry. Okay, So as uh, Kitan notes, what we have here is a celebration of a will to live and a celebration of freedom despite old age, despite humiliation, and despite the moral confusion that Thompson experienced uh, in his old age. And just to sum up now, let us see then what was the meaning of these betrayals, okay? Uh, what happens uh, after the book is published is that Thompson is now able to reunite with Marie, okay? So he sort of surrenders, uh, but he doesn't surrender to, to those who accuse him, but he surrenders to what we could call the redemptive capacity of love. Okay? So if we recall Kierkegaard and um, Kierkegaard's story in Fear and Trembling about the relation between Abraham and Isaac, he talks about betrayal there. And he says that Abraham is caught in a double bind between the realm of ethics and the realm of religion. God calls upon him to kill his son, Isaac. Okay, so the law would forbid that. So if he obeys the religious realm, the word of God, he would betray the ethical realm, the law. Now, if he obeys the ethical realm, the law, and does not kill Isaac, then he would betray the religious realm, God. So in either case, Abraham is caught in this double bind. And what can he do? He, he will have to betray the religious or the ethical realm. And what he chooses to do is to follow blindly the call of God. This is what Hamsun does. And this is what Marie did. So uh, what we could say is that the necessity of treason shows itself when the person who is betrayed falls from grace. And in that falling, looks into the eye of the traitor and sees in that gaze the necessity 
of this act of treason. This is what enabled Homsen to reunite and to come together with his wife. This is what will enable reality literature to catch up with Homsen and we can ask if this is a necessary insight to reconcile with Homsen's treasonous acts. What we could say is that the religious injunction, and in Homsen's case, the artistic injunction, is to resist the temptation of the ethical, the realistic domain. When Homsen disobeyed the demands of autobiography, he obeyed his artistic call. So in the end, Homsen's is a story, in fact, of heroism and of reconciliation. It is a story about the acts of art and of love. Thank you very much.